Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first President's Forum of this school year. My name is Sandra Banks, and I'm honored to serve here at the University as Vice President, University Relations. And we're coming to you today live from the Theater of the Arts, and very excited to host a truly hybrid uh, in-person and virtual event here on university campus. Before we begin our program today, it is very important to reflect and acknowledge that the university's campuses in Waterloo, uh, Kitchener and Cambridge are located on the Haldeman Tract, six miles on each side of the Grand River uh, granted to the Haudenosaunee of Six Nations. The land inside and surrounding the Haldeman Tract including our Stratford campus, is the traditional territory of the Attawandran, the Anishinaabeg, and the Haudenosaunee. I also acknowledge and recognize this area is now home to a diverse uh, group of First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I'm joined here in the Theater of the Arts by President Vivek Goel and a live audience, as I've mentioned. And whether you are here in person or tuning in today online via Microsoft Teams. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time and joining us. Vivek, I hope you're having a great start to the fall term. I know my own experience coming back to campus has been a rich one, really enjoying the vibrancy of campus life and seeing uh, our students really engaging with, with each other and, uh, and faculty and everyone else on campus. Well, Sandra, uh, thanks for hosting today, and I agree, it's been just wonderful over the last few weeks to see our campus come back to life, uh, our students, how excited they are to have the opportunity to engage with each other and with the community. Um, just this past weekend, we had Alumni Black and Gold Weekend and some great activities here on campus. I was uh, at the Ontario University Fairs yesterday, and uh, first of all, just a big thank you to all the volunteers and staff that made that such a Great success, our booth was packed throughout the weekend. And so it's just wonderful to see people coming back together. It's great, this is my first presence forum uh, with an in-person audience, and so it's great to have people in the room, as well as all of you joining online. So it is also our first time with a hybrid format, and so I hope everyone will be patient as we continue to work our way through the technologies. Um, I, I would like to reflect on uh, the land acknowledgement that you just made and, and note that over the last few weeks we've uh, had some very significant events on campus. Um, a couple of weeks ago we did our institutional commitment ceremony uh, starting with a sunrise ceremony and then the formal commitment and really want to thank Gene Becker, uh, Mayangan Henry and Elder Bill uh, for all of their support uh, with planning the commitment ceremony and, and walking us through from their perspective what their uh, expectations are as an institution. Uh, and then last uh, Friday, uh, I want to thank everyone that participated in our walk around uh, Ring Road uh, for uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day. And it's really great to see the level of engagement uh, that is happening on campus. And it's really important that we all continue our own learning and our own education. That's uh, the message uh, that has come through very clearly over the last few weeks. Um, everyone that I've talked with reflects on how much they learned personally uh, from taking part in those uh, events. And we thought we'd share a little clip from the commitment ceremony. First of all, I'd like to thank our elders that have joined us, share their knowledge, their wisdom, their traditions. I'd also like to thank everyone that has joined us here. Because this commitment is not an individual commitment, it is an institutional commitment that we are making. And it is a historic and momentous occasion as we affirm our commitment to reconciliation, indigenization, and decolonization. In our hope and in, in determination, we ask that you um, offer it at, at a level probably that might be even higher than, than we've ever done before. Certainly, I individually and on behalf of the institution am prepared to make the commitment. And with all of my colleagues here, 
I would also ask that they share in, in this commitment. And we know that's more than just the things that we've started, I'm trying to recruit more students, hiring more staff and faculty, developing the programs. It is, as you're saying, looking at our structures and our processes and our policies. And this will be a difficult journey. This will be a challenging journey ahead. This will not happen overnight. It starts with understanding the past. It starts with building the relationships as we are doing today and committing as we are doing today to walking this path together. Thanks very much, Vivek, for sharing that video, but also those very timely and important reflections from the last couple of weeks here on our campus. I know for my own part, I look forward to continuing my learning and doing whatever I can to help advance the university's indigenization efforts. Uh, because we all know this is an important part of the journey, as you noted, um, as we think about and plan for the future of our university. Uh, which is what we're here to talk about today, of course. Waterloo at 100 uh, is a visioning exercise that has us looking ahead to where we want to be at the 100th anniversary uh, of the university in 2057. Today we'll hear more from Vivek about Waterloo at 100 uh, and the content of the discussion paper that was released in September and that is now available online at the Waterloo at 100 website. And we also want to hear from you in the audience, whether you're here in the theater or online, um, so that we can continue this very important discussion. Following a presentation from Vivek, uh, we will move into, of course, a Q&A session uh, to hear your feedback and questions. Um, for those joining online, you'll notice that there will be a Q&A feature that will open up on the right-hand side of the screen once we get to that uh, period of the meeting. Um, and we'll be taking questions both online and from uh, audience members in the room today. Uh, but first, we think it's important to set the stage um, and play a short video. Some of you may have seen this if you uh, watched uh, the recent celebration of life honoring Douglas Wright. Wright, as many of you may know, served as the first dean of the Faculty of Engineering from 1958 to 1966 and as Waterloo's third president and vice chancellor uh, from the period 1981 to 1993. And he passed away in May of 2020. Of course, the university was unable to properly mark uh, his passing in a significant way until a few weeks ago. So, um, and in, in preparation for that, we worked very closely with the Wright family, most of whom are very proud uh, alumni, to help honor his legacy. So before we peer into the future, let's take a moment and look at the past. Douglas Tyndall Wright left a teaching position at Queen's University to join the upstart University of Waterloo in 1958 as the first chair of its civil engineering department. Wright soon became the university's first dean of engineering and, at 32 years old, the youngest in Canada. What attracted Wright to Waterloo was its lack of inertia and its appetite for change. Where other institutions were unwilling to change their customs and curriculum to help build Canada's post-war economy, Waterloo was open to radical approaches to post-secondary education that would meet the country's needs. Wright understood that cooperative education combined with mathematical modeling, computer science and theoretical research was a way for Waterloo to distinguish itself, giving its graduates both academic and real-world experience while placing its faculty and students on the cutting edge. In 1981, at age 53, Doug Wright returned to Waterloo as its third president and vice chancellor, his arrival signaling a return to the restlessness and momentum of the university's early years. As a champion of cooperative education and research intensity, he encouraged creativity and risk-taking. He strongly believed in professors and creators retaining their intellectual property. Under Wright's leadership, Waterloo's spirit grew more entrepreneurial and international and Wright helped the university take its spirit of innovation to the world. Doug Wright's career at Waterloo is closely tied to its origins as an institution and to a period of accelerated growth in both size and reputation. It's fitting that that first permanent academic building on our main campus now bears his name. 
Our campus community is forever reminded of his legacy as a visionary leader who served this university, his community, his family, and country at the highest levels. Okay, well, th thanks for uh, listening to that. And if you're interested, there's a longer version of this video online as well. And as Sandra noted, it's really always important to look back and see what we learn uh, from those that came before us as we think about our future. So if we, we're just going to quickly uh, present an overview of Waterlet 100. As Sandra noted, there is a paper uh, that's been uh, developed for discussion and that's available on our website. So we go to the next slide. The purpose of this exercise is to look beyond our usual five-year planning cycles. Um, they serve a good purpose, but five-year plan windows can often narrow our focus, um, particularly in the academic situation where it takes a longer time, for example, to develop new programs and, and new research initiatives. It's also a good time for us uh, to take stock of where we've been as an institution and where we're going. Just like the time of our founding, uh, the world is at a crossroads. There's a lot of rapid changes happening, as I'll outline in a minute. So if we go to the next slide, we've already heard a little bit, um, uh, actually back one, please. <laughs> um, we've already heard a little bit uh, about one of our founders, but if we think back to our founding, uh, it was our local community leaders that saw a need for a new kind of university, a new approach to education, in particular at that time, preparing engineers for the rapidly evolving industries uh, that we had in the region. Uh, computers were just uh, coming in, automation was starting, and that led to the development of what has now become the co-op model of education. We also did many other things that were unconventional, having one of the very first mainframe computers at our university and making that available as a resource for our students. Um, we've had different uh, approaches, for example, to the education in math, computer science, and statistics, where we have had, since almost our founding, a standalone faculty, a standalone faculty an environment, which today obviously is something absolutely essential given what's happening in the world, but our founders saw the need for it decades ago. So if we go to our next slide, we have evolved in a very different way. Uh, we have, as I mentioned already, cooperative education and work integrated learning as a key differentiator. Innovation and entrepreneurship has really been embedded within our DNA and while we celebrate uh, quite a bit entrepreneurship in terms of founding of companies uh, and commercialization of research, really we have a culture of entrepreneurship that prepares people to be problem solvers across a variety of sectors in the public sector, in community organizations, in global uh, communities. We've also developed a culture of research that's very connected and in many cases driven by cooperative education and entrepreneurship. And then finally, we continue to have a very deep connection to the communities around us, the communities that founded us. Go to the next slide. Our local region has obviously evolved quite a bit in those 65 years. Um, we have now evolved to be a leading uh, community in terms of population size. Um, in, it's a global tech innovation center. We have organizations such as Communitech in our community that were established in the last 20 years. We have major research institutes such as the Perimeter Institute, CG, Research Institute on Aging, um, and very few other communities our size have three post-secondary uh, institutions as well as globally leading research institutions of the caliber that we have around us. And so it, it help, forces us to think about what that evolution has been in our community and how we relate to and work with all these other 
partners that we now have in our region. But it's also important to bear in mind that our region has evolved tremendously. It's uh, grown, we've got much greater diversity in our region, and as with many parts of the country and many parts of the world, we also face many challenges in our community uh, with housing, with food security, with the environment. And so we have to also question ourselves, what's our role in supporting our community with its challenges? Go to the next slide. Globally, there's many issues that we face, and I could spend hours talking about all these challenges. Uh, we're still in a global pandemic, uh, and even before the pandemic, we had many health challenges in front of us, and there'll continue to be many health challenges. Uh, chronic diseases, aging, uh, all of these are fueling uh, the questions that are emerging about the sustainability of our health system. We have a rise in polarization, um, increased flow of misinformation and disinformation in society. And we can often say, well, that's happening in other parts of the world. But we just think back to this winter, we had very significant events in our own country uh, that we have to continually pay attention to. Uh, we have armed conflict happening in so many parts of the world. Uh, and again, in recent days, we see the threat of nuclear warfare happening possibly in Europe. And against all of this, we have the climate crisis. And every time I do this talk, there's been another weather event to mention. And so over the last few days, we had Hurricane Ian, and the week before we had Fiona, we had the floods in Pakistan. But even in our own community, we can see from the extreme swings in weather and events that we've had just over this past summer, the impact of this climate crisis. So it can get depressing to think about all these challenges ahead of us and what our students and alumni are gonna face in the future. But it's also interesting to think about what are our unique opportunities given our differentiators our unconventional history for us to contribute to what lies ahead globally. Finally, we need to think about our evolving institutional context. Um, we have grown tremendously as an institution since our founding 65 years ago. But in many extents, we continue to run in ways like we did when we were a much smaller institution. Uh, we've grown in terms of our proportion of graduate students. We've grown in terms of our proportion of international students. All of that adds to complexity and managing our institution. And so we do need to think about how we work in the environment uh, that we're at in and with the kinds of programs we're delivering now. We're also doing this in an era that has declining public support for post-secondary education in most jurisdictions in the world, but particularly here in Ontario, but not necessarily declining public interest in what we do. And certainly, we could all say increased regulation of our day-to-day -day activities. Um, we've also seen over the last few years tremendous shift in the use of online and digital tools, accelerated by the pandemic, but trends that were underway well before the pandemic. And the expectations of the students coming in today and in the years to come will be very different than the experiences that faculty and staff had when they were students. As we've heard, we have a significant focus on indigenization, we have a focus on decolonization and anti-racism. We have an increased attention to and commitment to wellness for all members of our community, and particularly a focus on student mental health. And with all of these changes, we're also in an environment of increasing competition. We have new entrants into the post-secondary space. We have the ability for colleges to provide uh, applied master's degrees, 
that was recently uh, allowed by the province. We have private sector institutions coming in, offshore institutions coming in, and we have new kinds of providers, uh, private companies, tech companies, providing training. And so we need to think about all these changes that are happening around us and what will continue to happen as we think on the journey to 2057. So go to the next slide. We've developed the futures framework to help us think about where we're headed as a society and as an institution. And we start by thinking about what is the future of humanity and ask ourselves very fundamental questions about where the human race is going. And we have scholars who are here in the theater of the arts. We have scholars here at this university spend a significant amount of time thinking about these issues. As we noted at the start, we also have to, a lot to learn from the people that have been inhabitants of this land uh, for so long. And even I learned over the last few weeks from Elder Henry about the sacred fires. And I'd like to play a little clip. Uh, for One of the prophecies that we've had in our, in our seven fires uh, understanding was um, there's going to be a time when we have to make a decision about technology. And, and technology is very addicting because it makes life easier and sometimes uh, we just think it's a better way to go. But the two paths that they talked about was one that keeps us connected to our mother the earth and all the things that is necessary for us to keep this planet healthy. The other one is technology where we get lost in computerization all the advancements of, of technology. But if we stay on that road, we'll lose the other road. So whatever we learn at this university, um, ask yourself, how does it benefit our, our land and our water and our future generations to have those things? So it doesn't matter if you're in engineering, if you're in math, or if you're in health or whatever, Ask yourself how what you're learning is going to benefit our beautiful mother, the earth. So I'd like to thank Elder Henry for allowing me to share the quote with you. And when we talk about our futures framework and the five interconnected futures pictured on the slide, I try to make the point that he made so eloquently and it's obviously been part of the knowledge that's been passed from generation to generation. Uh, uh, through our indigenous communities here. And so when we talk about the five interconnected futures, we start uh, on the left with societal futures. And this is where we think about this evolution that's happening in humanity and where we want humanity to go, the impacts that we're having on families, on communities, on our relationships between nations and different parts of the world. We can also think about the changes that are happening to us as a university community because we are also a society. Then we identify two areas, health and sustainable futures, where we see, based on the work done to date, uh, previous strategic plans, the greatest opportunities for Waterloo to contribute uh, to the challenges facing the world. And it, you can see that these are all interrelated. Um, in health, again, we don't have to explain why it's such a significant challenge. Uh, we've got great opportunities here at the University of Waterloo. Um, we have a focus on health and wellness through our programs in the Faculty of Health. Uh, we have a focus on aging in the community. We have great programs in the health professions, uh, such as optometry, pharmacy, social work, kinesiology. Uh, we also have incredible applications coming from areas, uh, from our technology strengths, such as in quantum with applications in the health space. And we have opportunities to work with the communities around us, the family health teams, the Ontario health team, our local hospitals who are reimagining their future at the same time. We think about sustainable futures, we again can see the challenges before us and we have so many things we can contribute in terms of potential solutions 
for global sustainability. But we can also bring not just technologies, but our strengths in social sciences, in humanities, in psychology. These are all areas that we'll need to work together because we know it's not just going to be about technological solutions. It's how do we solve the challenges of adoption, whether they're personal adoption or policy and funding. As we think about sustainable futures, we also have to think about the sustainability of our own campuses. We have some very ambitious commitments. I see Stepanka's leaving now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the person responsible for sustainability. <laughs> Sorry to pick on you. Um, but we have very significant challenges uh, in meeting the ambitious goals that we have set for ourselves. And we can't be leaders in finding technological or social solutions to sustainability if we're not doing it on our own campus. When we talk about technological futures, this is where we would, I think, think of our traditional strengths as an institution, if we think back to our founding. I mentioned quantum, nano, AI, robotics, data science, advanced manufacturing. There's a many areas in which we are global leaders in technologies. But the real question we need to ask is what are we going to use these technologies for, not just developing technologies for technology's sake. And that's where the interconnection with the other futures becomes so important. It's also important, as we think about our technological futures, that we continue to maintain our strengths in fundamental science and scholarship. We won't be leaders in technologies in 2057 and beyond if we don't continue to maintain our strengths in fundamental science today, because we can't imagine what those technologies will look like. And the final future is economic futures. And put simply, we need to generate resources in order to be able to meet all the challenges that society faces. And put bluntly, Canada has a productivity challenge. Our population is growing faster than our economy is growing, and certainly our challenges are growing faster than that. So we need to figure out how we can generate wealth and how we can generate it in an equitable and inclusive and sustainable manner. And we need to also work on generating wealth that everyone in our community can benefit from. And we have a great opportunity here at the University of Waterloo, given the way in which we have developed as an institution. We don't have a standalone business school. We have business education embedded across all of our faculties. And so as we think about the big challenge that we face in different sectors of the economy, we have graduates coming out prepared with good business and analytic skills in those sectors. And we have faculty working at those intersections. So to close, go to the next slide. As we go to our journey to 2057, we've developed three forecasts. And if we go to the next slide, we have graduates for 2057. And we lay out in the paper a series of attributes for discussion about what we might want to think about as the characteristics of our graduates in 2057. And I won't go through all of this right now, but just to highlight I think one of the key things is going to be, it's already becoming, is that we're no longer about a once and done type of approach to education. Uh, people will need to interact with us throughout their careers, throughout their life courses. And so graduates who never stop learning, I think will be a key element for us to think about. The second forecast is knowledge 2057. And again, we think here about how we ensure that our knowledge is connected with those around us, that our knowledge is trusted. Uh, and maybe the one thing I'll emphasize on this one is really starting to think about knowledge that counts. What is the impact of the work that we do? 
what is the knowledge that we teach to our students, rather than just counting how many papers we have, how many citations we have. And the final forecast is Campus 2057, where we look to what our campus and community can look like in 2057. And, and last week, uh, Jean Becker and uh, Mayang and Henry opened our board retreat with their vision for what an indigenized campus would look like and gave us some very concrete suggestions for us to think about. We can also think about what an accessible campus would look like on a number of dimensions and what a sustainable campus would look like. The key point is we have to start with the change on our campus if we're going to position ourselves as leaders globally. We go to the next uh, slide, which is the final one. So we're looking forward to uh, the discussions today and through the consultations we're gonna have in the coming weeks. And as we move forward, we're gonna evolve our strategic planning process so that we will have our long-term vision. And you can see if you've uh, followed the current strategic plan that the three forecasts map to the three themes in the existing strategic plan. And so a lot of the work that's already started will uh, continue on. Uh, but we will do it with a longer term time horizon and then back up what we need to accomplish in specific five year windows. So with that, I look forward to the discussion. Absolutely, thank you Vivek. As you make your way back to center stage here, let me just say that uh, from a personal point of view, I find um, the, the, it a very compelling construct, the interconnected nature of the futures the three forecasts together uh, and combined with the foundational strengths of our differentiators. So I think it's a very good strength uh, to start with, very good positioning to start with, but we didn't come to hear my perspectives. We came to hear from all of you in the audience. Um, let me just make a few housekeeping points as we get into this discussion. Um, we, as Vivek mentioned, we are testing a new hybrid model for this forum. We hope it's working for all of you out there and in here. Uh, bear with us if we have any bumps along the way. Um, the online Q&A in Teams, in Microsoft Teams, is now open. It's open to those of you online as well as, as, well as those of you in the theater if you want to sign in to the, to the registration uh, for this meeting. Um, and our plan is to start with some of the pre-submitted questions that we received during the registration. Um, we'll start with those, we'll then move into some of the questions we receive online, and then toward the end of the discussion, we'll queue up our uh, audience in the theater to see if there's any questions that we can take from, th from those of you in the room. I should mention, before we get into the questions, that we do have with us several leaders, other leaders from the university community. We may call on you to help out with some of the answers and some of the discussion. If so, we'll ask you to approach the, uh, the podium on my right uh, and just in front of you. So with that, why don't we get into some of the uh, comments and questions that we heard early on in uh, during the registration. And the first one that we'll start with is um, what kind of feedback and reaction uh, from the communities are you hearing so far up for this vision of Waterloo? Yeah, so far we've had a really positive engagement with the community. Um, this started uh, back in the early, late winter and spring where we did an initial round of consultations and I met with well over a thousand people and we had more submit feedback online. And then based on that, plus all the work that had been done in the previous strategic planning and the background papers and task forces and so on, we developed this discussion paper. So first of all, what we are laying out is the result of a great deal of engagement that's already occurred. I, I think we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm for taking this longer term view, um, the ability to think about, not let the immediate barriers come into the way of thinking about big ideas. And so we've got very positive responses around that. I think I'm also hearing very clearly that the community really does resonate with this unconventional history and wants to find a way for our, us to continue to be unconventional in the ways in which we work and uh, build on our successes in the past. The final thing that I would say is, is coming up in quite a few of the discussions 
is that if we are going to do the ambitious things that we're starting to hear about, we are going to have to change some of the fundamental ways in which we organize ourselves and work. Um, as I said, we were built and, and work uh, in a way that served us well in our early years, in our years of rapid growth. We live in a different world. And so we need to think about, as we look ahead to 2057, those kinds of changes as well. Absolutely. So the second question also came in prior to the, uh, the, the discussion today. And it's about how Waterloo at 100 is actually processing the information that's coming in through this consultation so that we're ready for the future and that we are um, able to compete in a very competitive sector. So first of all, uh, we're, we're getting lots of inputs and I look forward to more uh, as we go through this session and, and the sessions to come. And please feel free also, again, you can visit the website. There's online forums uh, that can be used to provide input. Um, we are starting to compile all of those and, and, and group those. And we've got some really interesting themes start, starting to merge. And over the next uh, few uh, months, um, we're going to start to feed back to the community what we're hearing to confirm with them those kinds of directions before we start to prepare the vision paper to go through our processes with board and Senate early year. Um, you know, it's some really exciting ideas coming through. And one of the things that we really want to encourage the community is to put forward those bold um, ideas that they have that people might not think uh, would make a lot of sense today, but could be very well where we want to be in 2057. That's terrific. So it's clear that all the input is being listened to and heard and, and uh, incorporated into the drafts as they evolve. But taking up on your last point, what are some of the biggest, most fascinating ideas that you've heard so far? Oh, there's so many. Uh, we could spend the rest of the hour, but we want to get more ideas uh, here. But I'll just pick on a couple of things. Like we've heard in a number of our sessions, um, are we too reliant on grades? And, um, and, and there's two aspects to that. One is, as we're recruiting students, uh, are we overemphasizing grades? Uh, and, and second, once our students get here, are we putting them on to this treadmill where they're chasing uh, grades? And you know, there's um, lots of uh, experience out there with things like uh, 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 authentic as assessments, with uh, low impact, uh, final assessments for courses. And these were ideas that were, I think, already being discussed in our community. But it's an example of the sort of thing where we can start to say, if we want to continue to position our, ourselves for um, a, a success in the future, is this the way, direction that we want to explore? And obviously, there's lots of implications about reducing a reliance on grades, what happens if people are going to graduate school and so on. But you know, if we take that longer term time horizon, we can start to think about that. Maybe one other thing that I'll uh, highlight is um, suggestions that are coming in for our campus itself. And you know, we talked about indigenizing the, the campus, um, decolonizing the campus, making it more sustainable. But what it really leads to is um, taking a more holistic and integrated approach to thinking about our campus. And I think this gets to my point about thinking about changing the way in which we work. Uh, we've traditionally developed the campus um, one building at a time, usually driven by one faculty's needs and aspirations. Um, not completely, because we have done things that are uh, covering the entire institution, but we haven't set back and said, what do we need next for uh, the institution? Um, okay, Hope, hopefully everyone can hear me. The, uh, so, you know, it's an example of, we have some bold ideas for the campus, but we would need to also think about how we actually operationalize that and how we do the planning towards it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now, uh, someone on Teams is actually wanting to pick up on one of your comments, yeah. and that is about, um, what are the things that the University of Waterloo is doing to indigenize? And what is Jean Becker's perspectives on this work? Yeah, so um, maybe 
we should just pass it to Jean, and uh, I think she's right here. But uh, certainly Jean has been leading these efforts for uh, a couple of years, and um, we've had a focus, obviously, the indigenous uh, cl faculty cluster hires. We've hired a number of staff across a number of units. Um, we've increased our programming. But we know there's much, much more to be done, and Jean has given us some great thoughts about that. Do you repeat the question? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Thank you. I'd be happy to. Um, well, there's two parts. So you're, you, just so you know the full context, and maybe Vivek will catch up on the other. Uh, what are the things that the university, of, the university will do to indigenize, and what is Jean's perspective on this work? Okay. So um, the university is actually already doing quite a bit <laughs> to indigenize um, with much more, of course, to do. But I would say um, our focus in the first two years that I've been here has really been on making sure that we have a representative body of indigenous staff and faculty. Um, you know, Indigenous people feel that you cannot include us if you don't have us. So you need actual people to lead this work. So we have hired um, quite a number of staff throughout the university in different departments to try and make sure that um, indigenization isn't done in a, a sort of um, um, ghetto <laughs> or a reserve and that it is uh, integrated into the entire university and as we attract more indigenous students none of them will be left out um, I'm not exactly sure what the question about what my perspective is on, on this, except to say that um, I feel that this has, you know, been a long time coming. We have been here for a very long time, prior to colonization, prior to the European um, arrival. I usually say uh, invasion, but I was <laughs> trying to be polite. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I, I really feel that what the work that we're doing is critical work for Canada, not just for the University of Waterloo, but for the entire country. Indigenous people are very much here we are on indigenous territories wherever we live in this country and indigenous people have been left out in the growth and the development of the country and that has to change. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Well, we definitely appreciate you taking the podium and sharing your knowledge and experience, and experience in such a generous way, so thank you. Uh, Vivek, we have another question on this matter. Why don't we just move to this? It, it also came in, um, uh, I think it was one of our earlier questions. What steps are being taken to ensure equitable admissions for Indigenous students whose challenges and ways of living are unique to their identity? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. And again, I have to thank um, Jean and her team uh, who've been working with the registrar's office and the faculties. Uh, to ensure that we all understand the history and the challenges and the unique circumstances that uh, Indigenous students might have. I, I know we've now got staff who are focused on recruitment of Indigenous students who are going to go out and visit um, in communities uh, around uh, the country uh, to help us in that recruitment process. We're also uh, identified uh, fundraising for scholarship support and looking at other ways in which we can support students uh, once they get here. And the final thing I'll, I'll just add to the points that Jean made is um, we have been working on improving 
our indigenous spaces across our campuses. Um, we've now recruited two of our fac faculties who have elders, and I know there's plans uh, to recruit more, so that when indigenous students do arrive, um, they have more people to look to uh, for that sense of community and to work with. Thank you. That's, that's very good to hear and important. So a question that has come in this afternoon, uh, John Beale from the Sustainable Development Solutions Network asks, you mentioned VIVEC business training being embedded across faculties uh, rather than as a standalone business school. How do you think sustainability literacy can also be embedded across faculties so that every student at U Waterloo can do well, sorry, can be well versed in understanding and conceptualizing solutions towards the world's big challenges? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, you know, there's a number of topic areas where I think we could identify these are topics that it would be important for every graduate of this university to be well versed in. Sustainability uh, certainly is a good example, as that question notes. Um, but, you know, indigenization, decolonization, anti-racism might be another area we want to consider. And so, uh, you know, I think it's important for us to think about what kinds of tools uh, we have. It's, it's very, it's relatively easy to say, let's make a course requirement. But it, as that list gets long, it becomes hard to create, have enough courses. And so we have to think about how we ensure that these very important concepts get woven into curriculum as they exist into existing courses. And so the first step, I think, as part of these discussions is to identify which of these topic areas are the ones we want to really focus in on and ensure are uh, made part of the experience for all of our students. And then the second is how we will go about ensuring it happens. And, and again, it, it could be through courses, it could be through uh, experiential learning. It, uh, I know there's been mapping of the co-op placements to the SDGs. It could be through extracurricular activities. And so as we think through um, what we think is important, we can then look at how we bring it into our uh, activities for our students and how we measure success. One of the things we do have is for both undergraduate and graduate programs, we have degree level expectations which get approved by our Senate. And I would suggest that if there are things that we as a community identify are so important that every student should uh, acquire knowledge in them, those are things that we might consider putting into those degree level expectations. Okay, thank you. Now the next question moves into um, another very important area and that's around sustainability of our campus. Uh, much of the infrastructure, facilities and buildings on campus are aging and unsustainable. What's the university doing to accelerate our move to a modern and carbon neutral campus? Yeah, so um, as I noted, this is going to be a major task ahead for us. Um, and as this question uh, has highlighted, we have on the one hand uh, an aging infrastructure, um, and we also have some well-identified needs. Um, so we, it goes back to we will need to take an overall comprehensive approach uh, developing a plan for our campus. Um, we need to look at how we're using our spaces, what we're using them for. Uh, we also have to look at where our energy is coming from. Um, and there is work just starting now on a district energy study to review how we uh, generate and use our energy. Uh, so there is a, quite a bit of activity underway. And I know um, the sustainability office can follow up and highlight. We will have our most uh, current sustainability report out in a few weeks' time, I believe, that will highlight quite a bit of the work that's being done in this area. That's excellent. I see Matt Thiessen over there nodding his head, so we look forward to seeing that, uh, that, that updated report. Um, now this next question did come in um, in one of the pre-submitted formats, so uh, let me just share that with you now. And it's got to do with housing. The cost of housing has increased significantly over time. Students from historically racialized communities are disproportionately impacted by the lack of affordable housing. How is the university assisting these students who are housing and food, and potentially food insecure? Yeah. So we certainly know that um, housing has always been a challenge, but this past uh, year has become a very significant challenge 
in this community and in communities right across the country uh, uh, with rising interest rates. It's a challenge uh, for everyone. Um, for students in particular, uh, in our community, it's been exacerbated coming out of the pandemic because a lot of the traditional student housing got converted back into um, family uh, dwellings as people moved out of the GTA into our region. People like myself, but I came for a job. Um, but the, uh, and, and so we have to work with our students and with our community. Our community also faces a challenge because we have a much higher population growth rate than a lot of other uh, communities. So in terms of some of the specific supports we have, um, you know, we do have uh, financial aid, uh, emergency bursary support available for both undergraduate and graduate students when they find themselves in distress, um, working with our student uh, associations. We have supports for students. We know that some students have been victim of uh, uh, fraudulent um, uh, rents and, and so on, uh, so we can provide them with legal support. Looking ahead, um, we are reviewing our overall campus housing plan um, and looking at what we can do as an institution to add um, to the housing stock that's available. And then working with our community partners with the post-secondary institutions in the region, as well as our municipal government and regional government partners on how we can help build, uh, you know, incent the building of appropriate housing stock uh, to meet the needs of our students. So it sounds like we're taking a short, medium, and long-term view on housing because Absolutely. it's critical. Absolutely. It's not going to be something that's, in terms of the fundamental challenges, it's going to be solved overnight because you've got to get that housing stock built. Absolutely. Okay, another question asked uh, in advance of today's event. Um, do you see a future where either all or a large portion of Waterloo's teaching, learning, and working is 100% virtual? So I don't see that as a future for this university. Um, it's something that I think as part of our visioning towards 2057, we do want to have a discussion as a community. Certainly, I think there is a future in we'll, which we will use digital and remote tools and tools that we might not even imagine today much more. And so there may be certain types of things that we do today um, that we will not be doing as much in the future. But uh, as we were chatting about at the start, I think as we look at what the return to in-person experience has been and the kinds of exchanges that happen, you know, our fundamental advantage as an institution is going to be in the provision of that environment which allows for those kinds of exchanges. As I talked about in the presentation, there are lots of competitors out there that are providing purely remote, purely online education. And that may be appropriate for certain people at certain stages of their life if they want to acquire a very specific skill set. For our community, for what we provide, for conducting research, I think it's much harder right now to see a future where all of the things um, that come out of those in-person interactions will be able to go fully remote. Okay, so the next question is somewhat related on the same theme. Um, given some of the conveniences, whether it's financial benefits uh, or other uh, conveniences of remote working, how will the university accommodate those who are calling for greater flexible working arrangements at Waterloo? Yeah, so this is obviously top of mind for every employer out there and, and certainly top of mind for us as an institution as well. Um, you know, we have been listening and, and uh, discussing with uh, our leadership about what the different um, requirements of units are and what the different expectations are. And uh, Human Resources has been working very diligently, diligently over the last few months on developing a new flexible work uh, guideline, um, which uh, I think again is in the final stages and uh, we hope to be releasing very shortly, perhaps even later this week. I think the key message I will say about that is that um, following on the previous question, we do see that we have a fundamental component of our activity that is in person with our students, with our research, 
uh, our interactions that we have with the community. And, and so providing in-person services will be part of our work for some time to come. But we also recognize that the nature of what that means very significantly uh, for roles across the university. And we have to understand that there are individuals on this campus that have worked every day on this campus since the start of this pandemic. And they've kept the lights on, they've kept us safe, um, and they will continue to do that. And there's other tasks that may be more suited uh, to being remote. Um, but we have to ensure that the needs of the entire campus are met. And so the work that's being done is to really allow for that flexibility to happen at the level of individual teams and uh, for individual teams uh, with their managers coming up with recommendations, but with the expectations for all the stakeholders that work with that team being met as well. So recognizing the interconnectedness of the institution. So it may not be the answer that people are looking for. We are, we're not gonna have a simple one size fits all answer to this question. Other workplaces where the nature of work is much more homogeneous can have that kind of one size fits all answer. It's gonna be three days or four days or whatever. We're gonna have flexible work, but it's gonna be um, customized. And that's why it's taken us a little bit longer to come up with this. But I think we will, uh, I think people will be happy and, and pleased to work with this. And this will also be obviously something that we will learn from and iterate as we go forward. So not an easy answer, not, uh, you know, a common question, not an easy answer. It sounds like maybe flexible and responsive uh, and responsible is, is, is part of the solution going forward. Um, getting lots of questions on teams uh, on the theme of equity and inclusion, really, really important. Uh, the question is, what work is being done to identify diversity at every level, age, gender, ability, race, and neurodiverse, uh, and remove barriers and ensure that Waterloo creates a true sense of belonging for everyone on campus? Yeah. So great question, and it's obviously a very important area. Um, you know, I'll go back to a year ago, we had a review of the Human Resources and Equity Inclusion Office, HREI which led to the creation of two new associate vice president portfolios. We just heard from uh, Gene Becker, and maybe I'll invite Christopher Taylor to come up to the mic and ask him to say a few words about some of the things that he's working on. But I'll, I'll just, as he's coming up, I'll just say this is very much uh, a top of mind uh, issue for us as a leadership uh, and for all of the uh, faculties. Um, and again, there's been significant investments, uh, the cluster faculty hires, um, positions in a number of areas. And as Jean said, it's not just something that is the job of one individual or one office. It's something that we have to embed right across the institution. So thank you very much, I appreciate that. Quite a bit of work is going on right now in these offices. So as Vivek has mentioned, the president mentioned, we now have the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, Anti-Racism Office. So within that, we have three units, which is new for a lot of folks. Before we had the Equity Office, now we have the Equity Unit, we have an Anti-Racism Unit, and the one that I'm very proud of and very happy about is we have the Education and Outreach Unit. So the big part of that is aligning to Waterloo at 100, we're really focusing not just what's happening on campus, and we have a lot of work with Nora, with CEE, a lot of work with recruitment, with our faculties and whatnot, but really looking to say that we are trying to grow what we're doing in terms of equity and anti-racism on a global scale. So not just what we're focusing on internationally, what we really do here at this institution, but also our KW communities, our University of Waterloo communities. And so for me, the big part of this is not just our structures that we're really pushing, but really understanding and implementing a sphere of influence. We want everyone to embody inclusive leadership. We want the three eyes of inclusive leadership, introspection, intention, and implementation. And a key part of that with introspection, a part of this exercise, is really seeing who we are as an institution, who we were, and who do we want to be. And so I implore staff, faculty, students in particular, to really understand who they are, how they can make changes as individuals on this campus, and really take that step further to implement 
change, which is critically the hard part that we're going to push forward on. Thank you, Christopher. Yes, thanks, Christopher. And a related question um, that we'll go to now that has come in this afternoon. Uh, the PART report, the President's Anti-Racism Task Force report, has highlighted that an overhaul is needed with regards to our HR processes. But what tangible steps are being taken to achieve this? Okay. Well, thanks for that question. First of all, the PART report had 88 recommendations, and uh, we're working diligently on implementation. Been, there's executive leads uh, assigned for each area, and, um, and we will have uh, developed uh, uh, an accountability framework, which we're going to be posting publicly how we're doing on each of the 88 uh, recommendations. I, I don't know, uh, Michelle or, or Jim, would you like to come up and talk about the HR-specific recommendations and what's being done? Hi there. Um, so one of the main things for um, human resources and looking at it is really from a policy perspective. So our policy 18 has quite um, restrictive um, pieces within that. So for example, we do internal hiring first, um, which actually doesn't ensure that we have a great pool of people and we, we, we need to start making changes there. So what we're looking at is the policies overall, um, particularly HR policies, to look and see where we can make changes and working with Christopher and with Jean's offices to make sure that we're taking those through and taking those, those forward. So starting to work with Staff Relations Committee um, and getting groups together to be working on that moving forward. very much. So um, we're going to take a, a little bit of a different tact with this question. You talked about financial sustainability and perhaps the precarious nature so often with public financing. This is the question. What is the university sector doing to support a lifting of the provincial government freeze on tuition? Is there any word on when the tuition freeze will end so that the rising inflationary costs of running Ontario's universities can be accommodated? So the first thing to say is um, our highest priority in government advocacy uh, is about increasing the resources available to our sector. You know, you're <laughs> responsible for this, Sandra. Um, and, and so we start by advocating for increases to our, our government grants. Um, with respect to tuition, the um, freeze has been in place for a number of years and I'll also note that the freeze followed the 10 percent reduction in tuition so it's been frozen at that level. Um, we continue to advocate uh, with the government for a review of that and relaxation of those provisions with an approach that includes uh, a firm commitment uh, to accessibility with set-asides for financial aid. Um, in terms of the specifics, uh, I can't answer the question. Um, we continue to hear that it is something that the government knows, it needs to look at, uh, but we haven't had any clear signals about when it's likely to get lifted. I'll also add, you know, the, the final part of that question was about the inflationary pressures, and just like everyone is feeling this in their personal lives, it's certainly something um, we are going to be feeling as an institution as well. So we're on it. Yeah. It will continue to be our, our number one priority um, together with the other uh, universities, uh, universities across Ontario. Now, I would like to remind everyone in the theatre today that if you do have a question, please make yourself known. Maybe put your hand up. Uh, we have some folks in the room that will help get a mic to you or you to a mic. Uh, I may not be able to see your arm or your face uh, given the bright lights here, so please make yourself known. But for for now, while you're thinking of that question, we d d did hear this come up um, a few times in advance of the event, and it's uh, a familiar question. Uh, with COVID-19 continuing to impact our lives, why haven't mask and vaccination mandates been reinstated across campus given their proven effectiveness? So first of all, I will say uh, absolutely, vaccination is the most effective measure that we can take and I encourage everyone to continue to maintain their vaccines up to date. The bivalent vaccine that protects against Omicron is now available to general population in Ontario. Um, the, the reality is that we're in a diff very different place with COVID-19 
than we were a couple of years ago. It, uh, with vaccines, with the immunity that's built up in our population, um, we don't have the adverse impact, the severe illnesses, the impact on hospitalizations and ICUs that we were seeing in the early days of the pandemic. The second thing is that in public health, a, a fundamental principle is you don't use coercive measures unless absolutely necessary. And the measures that we took in the early days of the pandemic, um, ordering people to stay at homes, disrupting their lives, their livelihoods, um, mandating vaccines are amongst the most coercive measures ever taken in society, right? And, and so we have to calibrate what we do to the level of need. And you know, the broad consensus in the public health community has been that we're at a stage in the evolution of the pandemic that right now, with the uh, impact that we're having, we don't need to resort to coercive measures. We should be encouraging the right sets of behaviors. Having said that, we continue to constantly monitor the, um, what's happening in our community, in the province, in the country. And uh, as we've said in our previous communications, we will not hesitate um, to bring back different uh, requirements if it becomes necessary. Okay, thank you. Now, we're continuing to monitor the room here at the Theatre of the Arts. Uh, don't hold back, but until you do come forward, let me ask this question. Uh, someone on Teams is wondering, uh, where do the affiliated and federated uh, institutions of Waterloo fit into the vision work? Well, first of all, it's a great question. Um, affiliated and federated institutions are a very important part of, of the overall institution and our community. Um, and again, if we think back to our founding, we exist because of um, those feder affiliated institutions that were there before us. And, and so as we look forward, what we really want to have is a discussion about um, where do these institutions play a role in the development of our community. Um, we've certainly had great discussions with the leadership of uh, the AFUs on several occasions. Um, as we've been having our consultation sessions over the last little while, uh, we've had great participation um, from staff and faculty from the AFUs in the uh, consultation sessions. And I would encourage the AFU members to give us their big, bold ideas about what their role could look like as we look to 2057. It sounds like a great challenge. Now, um, we are going to wrap up. This may be the second last question for the afternoon. Um, what are the plans for our North Campus? How do we ensure such a large piece of land is developed with visions such as Waterloo at 100 and with sustainability and interconnect interconnectedness with main campus at heart? Yeah, so the North Campus is a wonderful resource for this institution. Again, we have to thank uh, those early leaders of this institution that bought that land for a price that seems <laughs> unbelievable today. Uh, but we have such uh, an amazing resource there with those lands. And so, you know, the board has um, uh, a, a framework for developments of the, those lands in terms of meeting institutional needs. And I think it's important that uh, as we think about our overall campus, and uh, as we talked about earlier, if we are gonna be more sustainable, uh, more integrated as we look forward, we need to look at our entire campuses and across all of our campuses uh, as well. And that would include uh, the North Campus, and certainly um, there are some wonderful opportunities for us to think about what we could be doing um, and, and we've already done. Uh, if we think of the Evolve building on the North Campus, it's a beacon for how uh, a, an office building can be developed in a sustainable manner. Uh, we have the ecological reserves where we have an opportunity to think about how we work with our indigenous communities on um, developing gardens or other programming there that help in the indigenization of our campus. So these are the sorts of bold ideas we look for the community to input into our process as we go forward. That's very exciting to hear. 
Now, this is the last question, and, and perhaps it's a great way to wrap up uh, in terms of how we may uh, envision these kind of events uh, happening in the future. The question is, what work is being done to ensure events continue to be accessible to all members of the community, including those working remotely? And uh, maybe I can take a stab at that, given that we are today testing uh, some new technology and human skills in, com in combination to bring this event to as many people as possible because that of course is our goal to uh, have an open two-way dialogue uh, across the campus community. So we'll look forward to any feedback that we hear on how this event worked um, but I think given the uh, discussion we've had so far it's very very valuable and important that we uh, invite all members of the community to participate regardless of where they may be working. So I don't know if you want to add to that. No, I'll just add, I think it again ties with this um, broader discussion about um, thinking about the Campus 2057. When we talk about accessibility, certainly we want to be physically accessible, uh, we want to be economically accessible, but we can also think about digital accessibility, or there might be another term to that. And, uh, and so, you know, I think I would hope that we start to think about ensuring that we develop spaces, we're developing in them in a way that uh, provides for more seamless opportunities for people to be in different parts of the neighborhood or different parts of the world as they engage with us. Wonderful. Well, it's a great theme to end on, perhaps, that uh, with time we have the opportunity for discussion and design to, to, to work together in uh, developing our future. So that is the end of our formal program. I'm going to turn it over to Vivek to offer us any uh, final remarks. And as you're making, well, I guess you can, you're going to stay comfortable in the, in the chair here. I will say that we will be posting uh, the results the, of, this, uh, of this recording online, as well as uh, answers to any questions that we didn't get to today. So watch for that in the next coming days. Over to you, Vivek. Well, I'd just like to thank you for hosting and all the staff who helped organize this. And uh, thank all of the participants um, for their engagement. Uh, I think we had well over 500 people understand uh, participating online, as well as the group that's here in the Theatre of the Arts with us. And please keep those ideas coming. Um, we will have a number of other uh, engagement opportunities over the coming uh, weeks, as well as the online uh, engagement that's available. We're gonna have discussions at Senate uh, in a few weeks as well. So look forward to hearing all those bold ideas for the future of the University of Waterloo. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Thank you.